I do want to say that for those of you who, who contributed to the National Grape and Wine Initiative and Wine America efforts to put money for a national clean plant network into the 2008 Farm Bill, that that funding is now flowing and we should be able with it to bring in many new clones and grape varieties and selections. So um, variety focus, we only get to one variety or one group of varieties a year. Um, it's not going to be long before we're going to be thinking about a Croatian variety focus and a Greek variety focus. So um, lots of exciting new stuff coming in. My job today is to talk about Sauvignon Blanc clones at Foundation Plant Services, and I'd especially like to thank Nancy Sweet on my staff, who did a fabulous job of putting my presentation for me. Nancy's our department historian, and she's an excellent scholar who's very good at getting into some of the old records, things left by Omo and Goheen, and some of the, the people who went before us um, when we did... Um, Whenever we do a variety focus, she spends some time researching that variety in depth, which is something that uh, it, it's complicated, it takes a lot of time, and you have to have actually a lot of knowledge about the history of um, viticulture in California and who, who the people were. Um, for instance, we were able to find out, uh, Nancy um, talked to the Concanon family, and they were actually able to find the documentation from France, which gave us the origins of FPS Cabernet 07, 08, and 11, which had never been dug up before. So it's, it's, it's quite um, exciting, um, some of the tidbits that we're digging out. And I, um, I don't think I thought to include a um, slide from our National Grape Registry, but as we get information about various clones and varieties historically, then we put that information up and build content on our National Grape Registry. And if you Google National Grape Registry or went to www.ngr.ucdavis.edu, you would find a fabulous website that has information about varieties, about clones at the FPS collection, nursery uh, contact information, and then um, also a really nice little um, fuzzy logic um, a search uh, device for synonyms of grapevines. So, um, so many of you already know about that website. I have a few cards for the website. I neglected to toss a box of them in my car today, but um, I do have a few of the cards if any of you would like to have that link. So, Sauvignon Blanc clones at FPS? Well, first let's talk about Sauvignon. In France, Sauvignon is used to talk about both Sauvignon Blanc and sometimes Sauvignon Gris, which is a gray form of Sauvignon with, with slightly grayer rose berries as opposed to the Sauvignon Blanc that is more familiar to those of us in the United States. And so we have, at, at FPS, we have 23 selections of Sauvignon Blanc and only four selections of the Sauvignon Gris. But um, in terms of thought process, we did the research on both the Sauvignon Blancs and the Sauvignon Gris because they are often discussed together in the European literature. Um, we are going to tell you about our selections after I give you a little bit of the history of how they're created. And we're including in this list things that are already in the California registration program, things that are provisional and um, will be registered as soon as we can be sure that they're true to variety. And we do that by a combination of amplographic observations. Jean-Michel Borsica, for instance, who I would say is the world premier uh, amplographer, visits our collection regularly and looks at our vines. Um, and Dr. Andy Walker here on the Viticulture and Enology Department faculty looks at our vines. And then we also do DNA testing. And I have a very um, competent um, laboratory in my my center that does DNA testing both on a custom basis and, and in-house to make sure that our materials are correctly identified. So if a vine has passed all the disease tests and been planted in the foundation but has not yet been proven true to identity, um, then we go ahead and, and label it provisionally. And then finally, grapes in the pipeline. And when we say that, we mean things, either domestic selections that have been submitted to us and we have not yet demonstrated that they're free of virus or created a free of virus um, subclone, or 
things that have come from abroad and have not yet cleared federal quarantine, which takes about two years, if a material comes in clean. Let's talk a little bit about what is a clone. Um, this is the definition from Hortus III, which is one of my favorite reference books. And Hortus defines a clone as a plant propagated by asexual or vegetative means, including divisions, buds, cuttings, layers, etc. Such methods are especially used with plants that do not come true from seeds. Clone is a horticultural rather than taxonomic term. And so it, it has to do with how something was propagated and what material it was de derived from, rather than something that you can subjectively test. In the use of the grape and wine industry, it's a variant of a variety that is in some way unique. And we think that that variability comes from changes and expressions of genes or minor mutations in the grape variety which accumulate over time. And therefore, the older a particular cultivar or variety is, the older it is, the more likely change will have accumulated. And I think that's why we see so much more diversity in the older grape varieties than we do in some of the, new, the newer ones. Now, cultivar is the term that most horticulturalists use for, um, for a cultivated variety. Um, I believe grapes is the only horticultural group, viticulturists are the only horticultural group where the term uh, variety is still used, but, but most people in the industry talk about varieties. Increasingly in the technical literature, we describe cultivars, which has a more precise meaning. And I, had, I couldn't resist quoting um, Richard Smart from um, Janice Robinson's The Oxford Companion to Wine about cultivar. Term developed by professional botanists to mean a cultivated variety. In a strict sense, fine varieties are cultivars, but the term does not have a wide following outside professional botanists and horticulturalists, except in South Africa, where it is widely and generally used. It has a major deficiency in that it has no adjectival form and therefore no counterpart to varietal. So, so that's what Richard has to say about switching to cultivar. And I will talk about varieties rather than cultivars today. Um, again, a varietal, it, is a distinct type of vine within one species of the vine genus Vitus. The terms vine variety and grape variety are used almost interchangeably. And we can determine whether a variety, we can, we can do a, a DNA fingerprint for a variety, which we can then clearly establish as a signature of that variety and objectively tell one variety from another, even when they're closely related or they look quite a bit like each other in the field. So within each variety, it is important to um, make field selections if, as you're improving grapevines and creating collections of grapevines. You go to field selections first and you take those selections and you then you can take that selection, produce one vine that's clean by going through therapy and at FPS we would call that a selection and we refer to the grapes in our collection as selections rather than clones because if we called everything in our collection at by a clone number, it would imply that we had done the kind of extensive testing that has been done by the French researchers and that we knew they were all different. And in fact, we don't know whether we have duplicate clones or not in our collection at FPS. We suspect we do. And then there's a concept of subclones. A lot of the German research indicates that if you take a clone of a grape, that the grapes are mutable enough that you if you took 100 buds from a single Sauvignon Blanc vine and multiplied each of them into a population, that there would be measurable differences between those populations. I'm, I'm not convinced that that's true if they all have the same disease status and they um, um, are grown under, under replicated conditions. And so we actually have a, a experiment that we're going to be putting together very soon with Nick DeCousley and at Gala, where we, we have a Pinot Noir in the FPS collection, Pinot Noir 23, that was discovered a few years back to have a virus that we've only recently been able to detect 
with some new technology. And we've made subclones of Pinot Noir 23, which are now being multiplied and will be planted out in a replicated block in a Gallo experimental field. So we'll be able to see if eight different subclones of Pinot Noir 33 produce different uh, have measurable differences in, in grape quality and wine quality, and also be, to be able to compare those back to the Pinot Noir 23 that had the leaf roll in it, because we never saw any significant problems with that clone. It was only molecular testing that found that leaf roll virus, and it may be that we will, be, we'll, we will prove that the effects of some virus is negligible. I suspect we will see a measurable difference between the old clone and the new clone, but I'm, I'm open to whether or not there's, the, 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 the question of whether or not there's uh, differences between the subclones is, I'm going to guess that they're going to be extremely subtle, if significant at all. So that gives you an idea of some of the things that we're dealing with at FPS and around the world when we're manipulating plant material to put it in collections, and maybe some context for some of the comments I'm going to make about some of our uh, Sauvignon Blanc clones today. There's a picture of our building. Um, the, the building was built with um, federal funds and opened in 1994, which was the year I became um, the first faculty director of the program. We've grown a lot. We had eight full-time employees at that time. We have almost 40 now. And um, it's a very vibrant program that only exists because of industry support. We're a self-supporting unit, and the university uh, only provides um, the, the salary of the faculty member, Dr. Adi Brohani, who runs my lab, and a portion, 60% of my salary. 40% of my salary is paid for by California nurserymen through their IAB assessments. So it's an interesting program. I'm kind of living halfway between an academic world and a, a business world um, as director of FPS. What we um, do with grapevines at FPS is we bring in new selections, which could be foreign imports, domestic selections, new varieties. We do disease testing. If the material is positive, we put it through disease elimination therapy, and we do it until we can get negative tests. So until all the tests are negative, the um, selection is put into therapy. Once it passes the disease test, it can be planted in our foundation, and it becomes a provisional foundation vine. And as I ex explained earlier, it goes through professional identification. If the identification isn't correct, we historically have just removed the vine. Today, our D DNA techniques are so sophisticated that if we can identify the vine as a different variety and know what that variety is and think there might be some reason that material would be useful, we will rename the material, which um, the scientists in years gone by were oftentimes reluctant to do, but we have a lot of confidence in this technology. And then it's the registered foundation vines that go to nurseries and growers to provide um, uh, healthy plant material that's in the California Registration and Certification Program. And incidentally, for those of you who have been following the um, now 15-year-long efforts to get the California Registration and Certification um, regulations updated, um, we have um, we we have been successful. The revised uh, regulations have gone to AOL. A L O. Um, and um, say it again, Nancy. OAL, Office of Administrative Law um, in Sacramento. And, and if nothing, if no problems are seen in the next 30 days, the new regs will be going into place So um, in July. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, in the historic FPS program, we used to use chambers, growth chambers, where we do heat treatment to get rid of virus. And this was a very difficult process. It was a little risky. It took m literally months of growing a plant at 37 degrees centigrade, which doesn't quite kill the plant and keeps the viruses from replicating well. And then we'd rescue buds from those heat-treated plants. And a small percentage of them would actually turn out to be free of virus. Now, we've pretty much entirely abandoned that technology 
And instead what we do is we go to the shoot tip of a growing grapevine and we cut out a piece that's 0.5 millimeters or less. So this is the smallest possible cutting that you can make from the tip of a grapevine. And we put it into tissue culture and more than 90% of those plants we will have eliminated the viruses that were causing um, the problems for us. Because um, virus causes symptoms very much like the kinds, because virus causes differences between clones very much like the kinds of differences you see between healthy clones that are clonal variation, it's extremely important when you're looking at clonal performances and, and varietal performances that the material be free of grapevine viruses. And here's a summary of data taken in clonal trials from a paper by Jim Wolpert from 1995. And he, the kinds of things you look at in a clonal trial are pruning weight, shoot number, yield, cluster number, those are per vine measurements, per replicate, berry weight, juice maturity analysis, sugar as bricks, um, acidity, pH, and then by calculation you might look also at shoot weight, cluster weight, and uh, berries per cluster. These are the kinds of things we're going to be looking in my Pinot Noir 23 subclone experiment. And then of course it's always best if you can to go through making experimental wines to look at wine quality parameters as well. Now that is extremely um, demanding work and I think you probably got an idea of how difficult it is from Jean-Michel's descriptions of the trials that are going forth in, um, in France. For various reasons in the United States, we don't seem to be able to identify funding for the kinds of clonal trials that go on in the United States. So we're very lucky to have the French material, which has been so carefully studied, um, available to us uh, here in the United States. Now, again, to illustrate the point that virus can, if, if virus is present in a vine, the clonal trials are meaningless. You can see here some fruit infected with grapevine fan leaf virus. And in different years, to a varying degree, fan leaf will cause poor set, shot berries, open uh, cluster uh, architecture, and in fact, um, would completely distort the data that you got on a clone that had become infected with that virus. And so that's something we have to always keep in mind when we start talking about clones and talking about nursery material. A leaf folds does the same kinds of things. Uh, it it uh, delays fruit maturity, reduces yields, reduces pigmentation in the berries. So you could have an excellent clone of leaf roll and it would look like a very poor clone um, until you got the virus out of it. So. And again, to, to, to further illustrate this point, um, the, the changes in a um, clone of Chardonnay and one of Pinot Noir, some work done by some of my French colleagues, and the change in sugar content and, and probable alcohol, um, at, which is uh, the European way of, of looking at uh, bricks. And you see in this one clone, virus reduced uh, yield 43%, reduced sugar 19 another Chardonnay clone with a different strain of virus, reduced uh, yield 50%, reduced sugar 14 In the Pinot Noir, 61% reduction in yield, 10% reduction in sugar. Um, a second Pinot Noir example, 37% reduction in yield, 3% reduction in sugar. Sure, there's some virus strains out there that are milder than that, but we never know when we combine virus and a particular sign in rootstock what kind of effect we're going to get. And if we don't have enough money to do clonal trials, we certainly don't have money to do virus effect trials on the clonal effects of all of the viruses there are um, out in the viticultural um, world. And so we are doing an eight acre of virus effect on on uh, yield and wine quality uh, experiment um, here on campus that we're planting this spring with the help of funding from the American Vineyard Foundation and um, with, with support from Gallo Winery for making the wines. But um, it's been a long haul getting the funding for that and uh, I think we're only going to do it once. Hopefully someday you'll be able to come out and see that trial. We've got the plants ready to go and they're going in um, soon. Um, 
I want to say um, a special thank you to Nick DeCouslian today. I'm sure Glenn will do the same. But when I put together this program, he was uh, extremely helpful in, in helping me identify speakers. And um, um, he couldn't be here today. Um, some folks that work for him uh, took his seat because he had had something come up. But it's been, been a pleasure working with Nick, and he has contributed a lot to the Variety Focus program. Uh, here's with Pastor Stim Pitting. Um, in some of the FPS materials and some of the French clones, but when you graph Chardonnay with Rupestre stim pitting on three different rootstocks, the 5C and the 3309 look okay, but the St. George, you see the pitting and grooving symptom here. I don't think anyone would want to see that on their rootstock um, if they could make a choice of clean material, and that's why we're propagating a new, what we're calling Russell Ranch Foundation with some of the new National Clean Plant Stock money. We've been assigned about a hundred acres of land, a uh, little bit west of the campus, and we're going to be putting in a new foundation vineyard where everything in that vineyard will be have gone through shoot tip culture and passed the most, the highest standard of uh, DNA PCR testing for viruses. And so we're, we're starting to create a new standard, and I've been extremely grateful to the um, other great programs like the, the folks in France. And the, I, I can't help it, I still want to say ONTOV, but I'll learn to say IVA. Um, and um, uh, the nurseries, because they've been, been whole, wholeheartedly behind us, even though it's going to be a big, big transition and expensive for everybody. But I think, I think it'll be a good thing, because I really do think when we can, we want that collection of squeaky clean. And if somebody finds a virus that improves their wine quality, they can add it back later. Now, I, I have to say a little bit about informal importation and suitcase clones. You know the kind of problems this European grapevine moth is going to cause for us. You know the amount of pesticide and research money and regulatory money the vine mealy bug has, has cost us. You know the kind of investment the industry has had to make in Pierce's disease research. There is no better vector for exotic pests and diseases than plant materials, plants for planting. And in the case of PD, the, uh, the glassy wing sharpshooter came in a nursery stock from the northeast. In the case of the vine mealy bug, we are almost certain that it was on table grapes smuggled into Coachella Valley from an Israeli breeding program. Um, we don't know yet how we came to have the uh, European grapevine moth in, in, in uh, the north coast, but um, one thing we can all do to avoid those problems is to uh, make it socially unacceptable to, to smuggle clones in, in, in luggage. I, I, I get very frustrated with the San Francisco Chronicle. They constantly make that seem like a sexy and kind of fun thing for a winemaker to do. And, you know, every time I get an editor there educated, they get a new editor that does the same thing over again. I'm tired of writing them letters. I think maybe I should just Xerox the same letters and keep sending them back. Um, anyway, uh, in, the, in the plant business, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, and of course contracts have become more and more a part of the business. And many of the clones I'll, I'll talk about today, you do have to have a license to propagate them, and you do have to sign a, a non-propagation contract to get them. But um, in, in many cases, it's the most valuable and desirable material for which that's true. So the origins of Sauvignon Blanc, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because I think Jean-Michel covered it very well. But we believe that the, ver the variety is from the Loire Basin or B the Bordeaux region. Um, it was a parent of our Cabernet Sauvignon. And it was first imported to California in the late 19th century. We also have, so we have quite a few FPS clones that come from California vineyards from those very early introductions before there were federal quarantine laws to formalize the importation of grapes. Um, Sauvignon Blanc FPS01 was from Winty Vineyards in Livermore in 1958. Um, we believe the original source was from France and that in 1984, in 1884, excuse me, Charles Wetmore brought cuttings to Livermore from Chateau Yaquim in, in the Sauterne region of Bordeaux. And so we're, we're, we're um, 
There was a time when that was the only registered uh, clone of Sauvignon Blanc. When I came on at FPS, there was very little else in our pipeline, but we believe that that's a very, very um, uh, excellent clone. Here's the history again. We think Whitmore shared the cuttings with Louis uh, Mel in the Livermore Valley uh, at El Moco Vineyard. And Winty purchased that vineyard sometime be before 1925. And again, we have to thank Nancy for teasing out all these facts, which will be um, posted on our National Grape Registry website before long. And then it was Dr. Harold Omo who went to Winty and collected the FPS 01 cuttings from Winty Vineyard in 1958. FPS 01 received 82 days of heat treatment in the days where we used heat treatment in 61 and 62. Um, it became a foundation vine in 1965 and was first registered in the pro program in 1967. In 1980, it was deregistered, I believe, because of pestris stim pitting. And that was about the time that Dr. Goheen went through and he eliminated everything from the program that was infected with pestris stim pitting. He created a heat-treated, non-rupestrous stim pitting um, uh, subclone, or found a subclone that didn't have rupestrous stim pitting. I'm not quite sure which. And um, it, as was mentioned earlier today, that that clone was widely believed to be the source of the New, New Zealand uh, Sauvignon Blancs industry because in the 1950s and 60s, researchers in the New World, um, uh, Davis very freely distributed a lot of its heat treatment clones, which were some of the first virus treated collections in the world, uh, to Australia, to Canada, and to New Zealand. <clears throat> Another old California clone at FPS is Sauvignon Blanc, FPS 22. Um, we have to thank Phil Fries for preserving this old heritage clone. Um, it was a old head trained uh, vine that was gnarled and neglected in the southeast corner of the UC Davis Oakville field station. And Phil asked me to um, take it in and um, brought us the cuttings, I believe. Um, and um, it's now a part of our program. <laughs> when we tested it initially, it had severe leaf roll and also severe rupestrous stem pitting. We micro shoot tip cultured it. That was performed around the year 2000. At that time, we had very little funding for this kind of work, and um, it would have happened a lot more quickly today with our new National Clean Plant Network. And it was first registered in the RNC program in 2001-2002. Um, Sauvignon Blanc FPS 23, we were talking about this one a little bit, um, my, the pe folks I was having lunch with. In 1999, from Kendall Jackson's Howell Mountain Vineyard in Napa, we were brought cuttings of a Sauvignon Blanc clone. And it was originally thought to be um, from the Dry Creek region or Russell, Russell River uh, Valley. Um, Daniel Roberts told me that the KJ winemakers thought it was the best fruit they had in the program, and actually it did not have virus in it. Um, another heritage uh, selection in 1997 came from a well-respected Napa County vineyard. Um, because it was an extremely old vineyard, we were fairly certain it was not FPS 01, and we micro shoot tip cultured that at FPS. We have Sauvignon Blanc FPS 29, which is from the former UC Foothill Experiment Station in Jackson, California. It was originally from the experiment station at Berkeley and then moved from Berkeley out to the Jackson um, Station where Dr. Goheen plant explored with an old map that place to, to harvest a lot of um, varietal material that might otherwise have been destroyed. It did have leaf roll. Um, we micro shoot tip cultured it in, two, and, and, uh, in 2003, and um, it's, it's now in the program. I don't have the date there exactly. Okay. And then Sauvignon Blanc FPS 30. Uh, some of you may know Larry Hyde, who's a Napa Valley grape grower. He's famous for having an excellent collection of, of varietal material in his vineyards. He's collected from all over the state over the years and is a very uh, knowledgeable person. And he has shared all of his clonal material with us um, 
a number of years ago, and we have worked steadily through that collection, uh, cleaning up those clones. So um, he uh, said that this was a Sauvignon Masquet type, and um, he gave it to us in 2002. It, um, we know now that Sauvignon Masquet are, by DNA testing, um, uh, just the same as Sauvignon Blanc, and so we use the Sauvignon Blanc varietal name even for the Sauvignon Mosquets in our collection. It didn't receive any treatment, and it is possible that it's the same material as FPS 27, which is also a Mosquet type. So, yeah, we, we haven't gotten to that one yet. Okay. So, then we have Sauvignon Blanc clones from France. Um, Authorized French clones are that we have here in Davis, and I need to update my slides. We have the in the on top INRA logo instead of the new logo that we should should replace this with. But um, it, it's still on top INRA in my mind for a number of years. I'm afraid it took it, we changed the name of FPS oh, almost 10 years ago from Foundation Plant Material Service to Foundation Plant Services, and it took quite a while, and I even slip up sometime before you know, people could, could bring themselves to leave the materials word out. Um, so from France, um, so we have re registered 241, 376, 530, and 906 from the program that Jean-Michel described today. We also have some g generic French clones that came in by various routes before the trademark program was started. These may be very good materials. A lot of them haven't had um, clonal uh, trials done on them here in the United States yet. And the thing about these materials is we never really know if they are what they were supposed to be. But we do have a number of um, what we call reported to be French clones. And those are FPS number 14, 18, 20, 21, 23, and 31. The Muscat, Muscat clone of Sauvignon Blanc at FPS is, is FPS clone 27. And it was um, brought here in 1962 um, from the viticulture station at Pointe de la May from France. And it arrived with the label Sauvignon Seven Muscat. And it was, I believe, um, uh, sent um, it came through quarantine and was registered for the first time in 74, so it was, it was likely um, uh, in quarantine for quite a while while they struggled to um, um, s figure out what it was exactly and whether it belonged at the repository or whether it belonged at FPS. We must have had an astute winemaker, as often happens, ask us to introduce it into the program because it uh, did not require any heat treatment, and yet it had been in the country for quite a while. Index testing in the late 1970s and early 80s is when we did that testing, um, caused it to be pulled from the foundation vineyard. We heat treated it and micro shoot treated it both. So um, it, its identity was questioned in a varietal trial in the 1970s in Monterey County, and Galais uh, identified it as Sauvignon Blanc. So the identity issue kept the variety from getting the, the profile uh, um, and, and notoriety that perhaps it, it deserves, but we got the issue resolved by Dr. Carol Meredith in her lab in 1999 when she showed that Sauvignon Blanc and Sauvignon Mesquet share exactly the same DNA profile. And so we changed its name to Sauvignon Blanc FPS 27 in 2001 and returned it to the registered RNC list in 2002, 2003. And I think there still remains some confusion about that whole long sequence of events that eventually brought it back to our collection and makes it available to you. I've told, I'm told by winemakers that it's an extremely valuable clone. We have Sauvignon Blanc clones from Italy um, that came to us uh, through the importation program. They um, largely came from um, um, Conigliano. Um, the institute there has always had a close relationship with UC Davis. FPS 06, 
07, 17, and 24. We have the original uh, clone numbers from Italy, and all four of those went through micro shoot tip culture. Now, all this information in the slides is in your packets in a table where Nancy has summarized it for you. And the entire uh, presentation will be online in a month or two as we do the post-production for today's um, presentations and then they go up on UC's integrated viticulture website. There's no charge to use those websites and most of our variety focuses over the years actually are up there and recorded. There was a selection that came in from Rochedo. It was Rochedo Clone 3 in Italy. Came in in 1994, was micro shoot tip cultured, and um, it's FPS number 28. A, a, a word about the numbering systems. In the case of the French clonal system, the relationship between the French program and FPS has been so close, we were able to reserve their clone numbers for them. So we use the same number here in California as we use for, um, as the French use themselves in an effort to reduce the confusion. And only the trademarked authorized material is allowed to use that FPS selection number. And so there we were able to, to create a little bit of clarity from the confusion on clone numbers. We haven't that, that decision was not made about the Rochedo materials. I know there's a few people from Novavine here, and it's something in the future we should think about whether your, the, the Rochedo numbers, the higher Rochedo numbers, whether that would be a possibility for the future. Um, with Sauvignon Blanc, R3 would not have been compatible because we already had more than three Sauvignon Blancs in our system, but there might be room for doing that. We're working a little bit with one of our Portuguese programs to try and make the clonal numbering system as transparent as possible. I, when I talked about this when we did the um, uh, variety focus on the Iberian varieties, I talked about the Tower of Babel in terms of synonyms. Well, clone numbers are a bit of a Tower of Babel as well. And um, we're working real hard in the National Plant, Plant Diagnostic Network to avoid um, confusion about clone numbers. We're going to try and have a standardized national system of clonal labor, labeling where I think clones developed at other clean plant centers uh, will help them with a, assigning a number in a, a system so that numbers do not get duplicated. It's an important issue, I think, um, to avoid confusion in the future. And then Sauvignon Gris. Finally, I would like to talk a little bit about Sauvignon Gris. Um, it is a, I, I understand it to be a different variety than Sauvignon Blanc. Is that correct, Nancy? It's, it's a, it's a subclone? It's a mutation. It's just different. Okay, so, so um, it, it, this is a different mutation. Um, just as in um, um, Pinot Noir, you have different color mutations of the variety that cannot be told apart by DNA analysis. With, with this case, Sauvignon Gris is also one of those subclones. The fruit is noticeably different, and in horticulture, you'd call it a different cultivar, but the DNA profile is the, the same, so they're just distinctly different clones from a biologist's point of view, even though different labels are used um, um, in the winemaking business. And um, I thank Nancy for clarity on that. We're preparing for a really big um, national meeting with about 150 people coming from Washington, D.C. and around the country um, next week. And um, so we hadn't quite had a chance to touch bases on all of these slides. So I appreciate having her here to get me clear on that. So FPS01 was from Chile. It was heat treated from 100 and not, for 194 days. You can see what a long process that was, and it wasn't always successful. It came over in 1980. FPS 03 is French clone 917, thought to be French clone 917, uh, micro shoot tip cultured, and FPS 04 is thought to be uh, from 917 again. But again, no guarantee that those clonal designations are correct in the what we call generic clone. True. Uh, True um, Ontav Inra 917, which has had no treatment and came through FPS, is, um, um, it is what receives the registered number 
917 in our program. So this is a good case to di differentiate our naming conventions vis-a-vis -vis the trademark program that Jean-Michel Borsica uh, talked about this morning. If it, if it has the authentic trademarked um, number on it, it came from the ONTOF collections themselves. And then acknowledgments today, I've thanked a few of the people that I um, uh, wanted to thank, but I'm going to do it again. I want to thank the American Vineyard Foundation for its help with this program and in ensuring that it's recorded so that it can be shared with the industry. A tremendous amount of effort goes, as I'm sure you know, into putting together a day like this. And it would be a shame that if the information that we've gathered and put together for you couldn't be shared more broadly. Not everybody can be here to taste the wines with us today, but at least the uh, technical information will be preserved and made transparent in the industry. Um, I'd like to thank all my speakers. They've done a fabulous job, and I hope you will join them for the reception this afternoon, uh, sponsored by Sunridge, which we appreciate very much. And. Um, I'd like to thank the UC Davis Extension staff. They make it very easy for me and my staff to, to um, uh, put on a day like this when we've still got to keep our, our door open uh, at FPS and take care of our other obligations. Um, I don't think we could do it without them, to tell you the truth. And um, I'd like to thank my staff, who work very, very hard on this um, on this day, and especially uh, Carol Lamb, who headed up the tasting team, and Nancy Sweet, who did the research for uh, my presentations. And with that, I'm, I'm uh, pretty much done. Um, oh, I, I should thank Nick DeCouslian again. I, he was very helpful in putting together this program and, and ensuring that we got some of the uh, wines as well. And I would be more than happy to answer any of your questions. You're asking whether there's a Muscat um, clone of Anta material? Right. This is something that they identify that we think of as the Sauvignon Muscat clone. Do we have a Sauvignon Muscat in your collection here, Jean Michel? No, no. But uh, the way of name is Sauvignon Muscat. Sauvignon is the same thing as Sauvignon. Sauvignon is the mother of Sauvignon. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so the Sauvignon was a mislabeling in addition to the fact that Sauvignon Blanc is a... Is a the, the seedling is close to the, to the parents. I see, I see. It was mixed before. Okay. Before. Okay. So, but the, the people find that the taste was not the same, so that's why they, they call it to us Sauvignon Escape, to differentiate from, from, from the real Sauvignon. I see, okay. So we should be ex for Chardonnay, for example, the, the clone 809 of Chardonnay has some muscat flavor. Okay. But uh, for Sauvignon, we never find any Sauvignon with, with, with muscat flavor. So, so I will repeat what Jean-Michel said for the, the uh, recording and then also for the um, those of you who might not be able to hear him. But Sauvignon is the parent, the parent variety of Sauvignon Blanc. And in France, so that the material that came from Europe was mislabeled with a different varietal name. But in France, they have never found a Musquet mutant of Sauvignon Blanc. And so that mutation perhaps is unique to California. And, um, and so um, if you ever would like some material, Jean-Michel, just, just feel free to ask. Um, and um, um, so, so I believe that, that you, given that, that the materials that we have are per perhaps from the first discovery of Sauvignon Musquet. Yeah. 